Hi, everybody. Welcome back to another episode of Bridge from the Past, Art Across U.S. History. I'm your host, Mary, and as you can probably see, today we are not using a two-dimensional image to jump into the past, but we're using a place. I am on location at George Washington's Mount Vernon in Alexandria, Virginia. This Constitution Day, we are shining a light on founding principles of liberty and equality, right? These beautiful founding principles at the core of our nation, beautiful like this garden. Mount Vernon is a fascinating place to think about these ideas. On the one hand, it's the home of the father of our country, our first president. On the other hand, slavery was deeply ingrained in Washington's world. Slavery at Mount Vernon is a complex story that challenges us to think about our nation's history as both positive and negative. If we're talking about founding principles of liberty and equality, we have to talk about slavery. How can visiting places like Mount Vernon help us grapple with this complex story? I'm delighted to be joined by Jeremy Ray, Mount Vernon's Director of Interpretation, to think about these questions. Jeremy, thank you so much for being with us today. Thank you so much for having me. Absolutely. So as you watch this video, think of questions you'd like to ask Jeremy and me. We'll be bringing him back on Constitution Day to look at all of your questions and answer them live. You can follow the link below to submit questions and you'll receive a variety of resources leading up to Constitution Day. Let's take a look at the greenhouse slave quarters on the other side of this building. Come with us. So Jeremy, can you orient us? So where are we on Mount Vernon? Yes, excellent question. So Mount Vernon itself as a property was five separate farms on 8,000 acres of land. Wow. And we are here at the Mansion House Farm, right? One of those five farms. And just right behind the camera off to the side is the Mansion House itself. We are on the north side of that here at the Greenhouse Slave Quarters, right? So on the other side of this building is the upper garden. It's a big, big beautiful garden space uh, mm -hmm. that Washington would entertain guests at. But of course, on the other side of that, other side of that brick structure uh, was the home of around uh, 45, 50 enslaved human beings. That's really interesting. So the garden and the mansion are on the other side of us. So this area here, this is not what visitors would see if they came to right. the estate in Washington's time? So Washington was the landscape architect of the grounds, and he designed it to have a leisure space for entertainment, uh, the bowling green, the mansion, the view of the river, the gardens, right? Uh, and this is a space where uh, very wealthy, high society individuals visiting the Washingtons would entertain themselves with walks and discussions. Uh, the garden here itself on the other side of this building is large and beautiful with a big centerpiece that is the greenhouse, mm -hmm. where you would see tropical plants, a very impressive space. But marking off the boundary of that space was, were these living quarters. Mm -hmm. now on the other side of uh, the building itself were the living spaces for enslaved men, women, and children. There were about 90 enslaved people here at the Mansion House Farm, and a good proportion of them lived in these barrack-like structures over here. So it was not typical for guests to come over to this space, but we have a lot of our written descriptions of what life was like and the living conditions in these spaces from visitors who came over and wrote down what they saw. So when we think about um, on Bridge from the Past, we think about using your observation to form questions. So I see, you know, this is a brick building and there's doors, there's, you know, glass windows. Is this typical of a structure for where enslaved people would live? Uh, so this is very atypical uh, for enslaved structures, but even here at Mount Vernon. Uh, as I mentioned before, Mount Vernon was five farms on 8,000 acres of land. And on those outlying farms, what the typical structures were were wooden uh, huts or, or buildings for enslaved people to live in. Uh, even here at the Mansion House Farm, uh, family units, it was typical to live in a wooden structure. We know that Botswain and Martilla uh, and their children lived in a wooden cabin structure closer to the West Gate. This structure is more of your military style barracks. And it actually was constructed in the 1790s and it replaced a larger multi-story wooden structure that's about right here where we are standing. Um, so brick structures with the fireplaces like this uh, were fairly atypical. Okay, and it's divided between a men's side and a women's side. So were these people not living with their families or we're just not sure? Right, so as far as living with their families, Washington uh, wanted his enslaved people to live where they worked. 
Mm -hmm. um, so for example, behind us uh, is the blacksmith shop. Uh, uh, Nat and George were enslaved blacksmiths. They more than likely lived here uh, in these quarters uh, where their wives, Lucy and Lydia, actually lived on the outlying farms because they were working uh, as field hands in those spaces. Uh, so th they were separated out. Mm -hmm. uh, the only time that they could see each other was on Sundays, their day off, uh, or if they would walk through the night to see them uh, during the night. Um, Washington uh, called this habit night walking. Mm. Uh, he absolutely despised it because he felt it made the enslaved people unproductive. Uh, but for the enslaved community, this was an intentional decision to take control over their lives, to see their family, to see the ones uh, that they love. Now, as for the men's and women's bunk, that's actually a decision that our curatorial staff here has made to highlight the differences in the lives of enslaved men and enslaved women. We actually don't know if it was uh, separated, men's bunk, women's bunk, or uh, if it was uh, mixed uh, between the two. Mm -hmm. I want to go back to your the idea of being separated from your family and this idea of night walking. So I think that just that that example is such a powerful reminder of you know, making a decision for yourself and like the idea of what it must have been like to not be able to be with your family. I think if we just sort of stop and think about that for a second, it's really powerful, really powerful. But you mentioned that your staff has decided to display it as men and women's to highlight what they did. So I'd like to talk a little bit about some of the artifacts in the room. So one thing that really draws my attention when I go into the men's side is the, it looks like a trap mm -hmm. made out of twigs or something like that. Could you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, it, that's exactly what it is. It was, it was a trap for catching animals. Um, again, the enslaved population here worked sun up to sundown, Monday through Saturday. They had Sundays off. Uh, that time was their time. Most spent it uh, spending that time with their family, uh, getting caught up in other work on the outlying, uh, excuse me, on their, their garden plots uh, to grow additional food uh, for themselves. And others would actually go into the wooded spaces in between uh, the farms and would trap or go fishing and whatever they caught, sometimes fowl, uh, birds, fish, uh, they could even sell that to, to George Washington. Uh, if they caught anyone poaching, uh, so illegally hunting on Washington's land, they could confiscate the weapons and then sell those back to George Washington as well. Um, so that trap is kind of a, a typical homemade trap for, for catching animals uh, on their day off. Okay, and that sort of brings me into the other thing that I noticed, which is the food. So you have, you know, you have the fish, you can see, you know, the game hanging by the fireplace, and you have these bags of with George Washington's initials. So is that they're supplementing their diet with the food that they grow and that they trap there on their own? Correct, yeah. So Washington is required to provide food for the enslaved population, and it's not much. Uh, we would look at it as, as kind of mere subsistence. Uh, we have it set up there, a bowl of a, a little bit of cornmeal uh, and then a couple fish, about five to eight ounces of a protein, a quart of cornmeal a day. So Washington dispensed that in big, large bags with his initials on it. That was about a month's supply of the cornmeal, and then they had to divide that up. Uh, so yes, a lot of the trapping, uh, what they're growing in, in garden plots, is supplementing their diet, um, going fishing and things like that. Okay. And on the women's side, I'm struck by the laundry. <laughs> it looks like laundry hanging, so I'm assuming that was a large part of their tasks here at Mansion House. Right. So Washington provided one set of summer clothing, one set of winter clothing a year. Mm -hmm. uh, and the enslaved people had to maintain that, uh, re do repairs, and of course have to, to keep it clean. So it, it's a constant process as they're keeping their clothing uh, clean. You know, they go and work sun up to sundown. Those evenings uh, are a time where they're taking care of themselves and their family. That's another, again, just to think about like humanizing this, that you have the same foods <laughs> that you're allotted in the same clothing. It's just to, to stop and think about what that means. It's a very small thing, but I think it's also very powerful. And the other thing that I think is striking in the women's quarters is the, it looks like a child's mattress on the floor, which for me as a mom of a little one is, again, driving home that there are children being born into this world. And what is that experience like for them here? Where what do we know about that? Yeah, well, the, the, the story of enslaved children is a is, uh, very tough one to, to hear because 
uh, going back to the 17th century, Virginia law stated that the child of an enslaved woman uh, was also enslaved and belonged mm. to their master or enslaver. So you're looking at a system where children are born into this concept of being a commodity, mm. right? Being this thing that is eventually going to uh, be for the use of another person to uh, bring them uh, profit and, and, and goods to sell, right? Um, so you talked about that little mattress that's on the ground. We actually have a writing of that from a, a Polish visitor who came to Mount Vernon, Julian uh, Nimczewicz, uh, who said that the enslaved people slept on uh, cots that were lower than what the lowliest a peasant would sleep on in Europe, mm -hmm. and the children slept on a mean pallet on the floor. So that's kind of the description of, you know, these little bed rolls or just some straw and hay or something that was laid out with blankets that that, that the children were sleeping on mm -hmm. uh, close to their family. Those um, cots, uh, I think they wrote that there were multiple adults sleeping uh, to them, whether or not those were family members or just individuals needing a bed space, we're, we're not entirely sure. So we've been talking about the structure and the things inside it and what we can see and what that might mean for the men and women and children who lived here. But what what doesn't this building and these the artifacts inside it, what doesn't it tell us? Right. And that's a great question um, because a lot of our guests come here to Mount Vernon and they see a brick structure with, with windows and things. And we hear this comment fairly often, oh, this isn't that bad. Right, and they're just looking again at the material structure itself. And they think, well, this probably affords a warm space, it provides some sort of protection, but that ignores the fact that enslavement itself is a system that only works through fear and dehumanization. While it may have a fireplace and it may be made of brick, we don't know how many people are actually in this space. We do know that, again, children are sleeping on pallets on the floor, multiple adults into a bunk. And another thing to remember is that the only way you can compel another human being to do work against their will is for them to fear something. Fear of physical abuse, punishment, fear that at any point in time, they or one of their family members could be sold away and never seen again. Um, while there may be doors on these structures, it does not prevent the fear that society has been weaponized to a point to maintain the system of enslavement. Mm -hmm. At any point in time, an overseer or somebody could come into this room, check and see what's going on, remove a person, arbitrarily decide, you know, they're going to be punished. Uh, Washington could decide, take them out. They've run away. I'm selling them. Right. So this constant idea of fear is not present when looking at this brick structure. Right. And it's really interesting. So we have looked at in past episodes, when we start with a painting or we start with a cartoon, we can make observations, we can ask questions. And the more you think about it and the more you probe deeper, the more you realize, ah, these people didn't you know, have the privacy. They didn't get to see or spend as much time with their family. So it's really... Um, it's almost like the longer you sit and think about it, the more you, you learn, the more questions that you have. So I am going to throw it back to you guys. So we have, we've covered a lot of ground in our conversation. So Jeremy, thank you so much. And be sure to send us your questions. We'll be back on Constitution Day Live to talk with you about the questions that you have, about how we can talk about a system like slavery and still talk about founding principles of liberty and equality these are really difficult questions, and it's a really hard conversation, but it's one that we definitely need to have. So thank you again. Be sure to submit your questions through the link below and follow us on social media so you get all of the good information about Constitution Day Live. Thanks, guys. Take thank care. You.